our current plan is really uh, just trying to raise raise funds because that's that's the constraint as we see it. You know, we have a huge waiting list with no marketing at all. Um, just word of mouth from the people who've been able to get loans and then from people who hear about it. You know, we had a couple of newspaper articles and stuff. Um, so kind of where we're struggling now is let's assume that we can raise the money we need. Um, I want to... Let me just tell, ask if this makes sense to you. From a, my, my plan is basically to go from where we are now, which is about 40 on the road, and 70 that we've done so far. You've got 40 Buddha Buddhas on the road. Active loans. There's been 25 repaid so far. And and uh, what's the total amount of the loan for Buddha uh, Buddha? Uh, the money or the time? The money. Um, about $1,900. So it costs $1,900, so people buy a motorcycle for $1,900 in, in Uganda, in Kampala. Over 16 months or 18, depending on And then they pay it off over 16 months, and what kind of income do they generate from uh, operating a taxi? So um, their, their take-home income after the main expenses, which are getting renting a motorcycle and paying for fuel, uh, tends to already be about five dollars a day and take home, um, which is why you find civil servants and teachers, especially in rural areas, leaving their posts to come drive a boat to boat because it's higher income and it's paid on time. Um, lots of teachers, for example, their salaries don't come on time and it's a problem. What are they making? Three bucks a day? Uh, uh, teachers, uh, uh, maybe four. Yeah. Um, so and so, if they rent a Buddha Buddha from a fleet owner, they'll clear five bucks. And right. how much of that? Go, uh, uh, how much do they pay to the fleet owner? Um, about they're paying about twenty dollars a week to to the kind of. Land and they're park. working how many days? Six. So they're uh, paying three fifty a day for leasing the six hundred twenty. Okay. Is three dollars and fifty cents a day oh, sorry, rent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you're uh, getting them to pay four bucks for the loan. Yeah. And uh, when and they're we, done with the loan, now they've got three fifty more, which is a good deal for them. Yeah. So it's a, it's a it's an instant income jump if they keep riding the same bike. Yeah. Um, but what we found and the guy who inspired us uh, did this as well is that many of them will sell it or sublet it. Um, and come back for a brand new bike right away. So they're becoming fleet owners? They're becoming fleet owners or just kind of accumulating capital in the very basic sense of yeah. development. So our, our the guy who's now our manager, who was my go-to Boda Boda driver for years, that's how we got to know each other, um, sold his first two bikes for cash and got others and used that cash to buy land and build his mom a house in her village. And so, it's the standard thing people do when they're making money. Right. Um, but for a lot of people, and I personally identify with this, you know, having a lump sum of cash is kind of like forced savings, and you might not be able to save that 50 cents a day or a dollar a day, but all of a sudden you have the whole thing and you can do something. Okay, yeah, life is really important. Um, but um, what, what kind of help would you hope to get from me today? Well, I'm, I'm interested in hearing about planning for scale and things like that because I am so wrapped up in the small intricacies of Uganda. Where did you get the money to make the loans that you've made? Um, so, when I was 14, I bought some shares of Marvel Entertainment, the comic book company, because yeah. uh, I just learned about the stock market in school. And when I was 22, um, I bought it for $1.80 a share. Uh, and then I ended up buying some more. So by the time I was 22, I had about 200 shares, and uh, Disney bought it for $50 a share. And having recently moved back to Uganda, um, and my house, housemate and I had moved to a cheaper apartment than we were anticipating, so we already had a mental windfall in our head based on our apartment budgeting. Uh, and then uh, the Disney bought Marvel, and I had I decided I didn't want to own Disney, so I sold all of the stock and 
spent part of it on going to the World Cup in South Africa from Uganda and over land, uh, which was... How much money did you have in your pocket from the sale? About 10 grand. Yeah. And uh, spent about uh, five on Boda Bodas, uh, which my housemate also matched because he had some savings. Um, but that was, we phased it in slowly. At first, we just bought three um, because our the first guy is now our manager um, was coming up on finishing his second loan, which is kind of what prompted us to say, hey, uh, how much do you pay? And, wow, that's actually kind of a lot. Do you want another loan? And do you have friends who want loans? So we bought about three and then just kept reinvesting because we didn't... How much money are you, how much interest are you earning on the loan? So uh, originally we didn't even know. We copied the model that Mehdi, the, the manager, had done twice before. We just wholesale copied it, but it turns out it's about 48% uh, annualized or like or 4% flat per month is, is basically how it works. What's the inflation rate in Uganda? Man, it, it varies. It's never been below 11%, but okay. last year it was 16, which was pretty brutal. Okay, so it's uh, 40 minus 16, it's still 25, 24. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty good rate of return. Uh, do you have a high default rate? Not, not so far. We've had, out of 70 loans, we've had uh, two accidents, so the bikes are kind of on hiatus. They're not uh, totaled, but we're not putting a lot of pressure on those guys because uh, they were injured a little bit. Um, and Do you get we, insurance? Do they get insurance? Not yet. Uh, I walked You're into You're going to have to insist on it, right? I'll, I'll tell you more about insurance in a minute, but I was going to say, then we've had uh, several, we've had about four stolen. So, um, a default rate's under 10% if you count those as defaults, but we're not... Uh, it ain't bad, you can improve the rate. Absolutely. So then on insurance, um, what happened is, by the, we just kept reinvesting, and by the time we had about seven, a Ugandan journalist and mentor of mine who, you know, had been to TED and things like that and knew the world of social entrepreneurship, and we didn't, got very excited about what we were doing and said, you need to scale this up here. We were just seeing it as, a, as we love Boda Boda, so this is pretty cool. And, and uh, what was his suggestion? He said, he, he said you need to think about the way that it, it's impacting their lives, like the trajectory and uh, said, you need to do more. And I said, well, we don't have any money. So he matched our initial investment and we registered a Ugandan owned company. So we doubled to about 14 bikes. At that point, I went into an insurance company and I said, hi, we'd like to get comprehensive insurance. So you get third party insurance is required by law, but comprehensive insurance is not. Um, so I started filling out some paperwork, how many motorcycles, and they said, uh, so what, what does your company do with 14 motorcycles? And I said, we give loans to Boda Boda drivers. And they basically threw me out the door um, because the Boda Boda market is considered to be too high risk. The guys are considered to be kind of ruffians who are dangerous and risky. And that's why nobody else is, one of the reasons nobody else is giving loans like this, like, including microfinance banks. Um, the other reasons are that the cost of the bike is pretty high for what a microfinance loan would be. Um, so we don't have insurance. So what we decided was, okay, well, if we lose fewer than about one out of 10 bikes, because that's about how much insurance costs for a 12 month comprehensive policy, then we're actually self-insured because um, even if with that insurance, we're not sure what our ability to get the payout for a lost or stolen bike is gonna be. Um, so you just up the rate a little bit to cover the... Uh... So because our demand is so high and our waiting list is so high, we don't have a formal insurance pool at the moment in the sense of money set aside, but I think I'd like to get that. You can set it aside yourself, but have you tried to spin the paper? What do you mean, spin the paper? What is that? Uh, you got 14 people that owe you uh, about 1500 bucks a piece. So you've got loans with a face value of uh, uh, 20 grand. Okay. No. You take that as to a bank 
or to some finance organization as collateral, and they'll loan you, say, 60%. Um, or you sell the loans for cash. No, I haven't, I haven't tried anything like that. If you're a business, you need to be become familiar with the whole thing about, uh, you know, I was in the equipment leasing business once. Mm. And equipment leasing, uh, I, w I was leasing uh, machinery to for auto body shops that uh, they use to uh, straighten out the dents in the cars and accidents and so on, or straighten the chassis. That's basically a credit thing uh, put in the form of a lease. Um, the basic, you know, the loan derivative scandal is basically marketing notes. So if you have mortgages on homes or office buildings, you can bundle those and sell them to somebody, to an investor, or get cash and do it again, and you make money. Or you can, uh, any business, uh, we started a carpet business uh, run by a friend of mine. He then, uh, once he had inventory, he could borrow on inventory, because he had a warehouse that had some rugs, and a certain percentage of that is bankable. And you can also, if you have a bunch of loans, you can take that to the bank, use it as collateral, and get a loan back by the, because the loans are an asset. Have you ever checked to see what the cash value of your loans are? They'd be considered high, li high risk. From what you're saying? No, I've never, I've never checked. Uh, a loan. If, if somebody owes you a loan on a motorcycle, you have the collateral of the motorcycle. But the disadvantage of that, it's no collateral at all. If somebody wants to steal it, you can't trace it, unless you build in. Uh, is there some kind of thing you can build in a GPS thing? Um, there is, but at the moment, um, the operating costs are too high. So, so, so it's a, it's a high risk loan. You, you have a deep discount, but you might very well get somebody, especially somebody in the microcredit field, who would be willing to give you a discounted line of credit based on the assets you have in the form of payable loans. That's a good idea. That's v just very basic business stuff if you're running a business, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the second thing is that there's a huge amount of... Uh, the microcredit business, although it's gotten a black eye from SKS, mm -hmm. you're familiar with that, right? Yeah, yeah, they overextended. Yeah, but uh, it looks like uh, they, they not only overextended, they made up their financial statements. Oh, I didn't realize yeah, they it got It's there big, yet. big, big, big trouble. So they, they really screwed up the microcredit field. But there's a lot of people who have invested in microcredit. That's now a legitimate area of investment. Microcredit for people in developing countries, that's a whole field. Have you explored uh, talking to investors, uh, social venture investors, especially in microcredit? Um, we're at the beginning stages, but not yet systematically. You know, we, we didn't even um, sort of expect this to, to, to grow as well as it has um, until about a year ago, maybe a year and a half, um, and I've been balancing it on top of, uh, you know, journalism in Oxford for, uh, until now. So this Don't is give me all the excuses, man. You're either in business or you're not. <laughs> if you're in business, you're in business. Well, we're in business now and we're in the process of exploring stuff like that, but we haven't yet. Exploring isn't the right word. Prospecting. No. <laughs> If you're the owner of a business, your life is focused on making that business work. It's not a hobby. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm overstating it a bit, but uh, you either want to do this or you don't. Right. It, it's, you, it, 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 one of the guys on my board of the company in India said, uh, Listen, you, uh, there's no such thing as being half pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. If you want, if you're serious about this business, 
you got to make it a major focus or, or get somebody to make it a major focus. You can't... This, is, this diatribe is based on your saying, well, I got stuff going on at Oxford and I got well, this and I, I got I that. I yeah. past tense. There's a reason I'm, at, I'm here in Boulder right now, which is that I realized about a year ago that I was more excited about the weekly reports I was getting about how our loans were doing in Uganda than I was about anything else. And so... Well, this but I still, I still say, to some extent, I say bullshit. Okay. Uh, how long ago did you start applying for the unreasonable? January. Uh, November. November. So. Uh, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Mm. In eight months, in two weeks of intensive effort, you had have all of the basic information you need about the microcredit financing available, the major investors in microcredit, bank, uh, bankable loans, uh, what uh, uh, kind of collateral uh, consideration you could get for the paper you got, if any. Um, that's not rocket science, but it means it takes an intense focus. Right which I'm beating you up on a bit, saying you haven't had it. I haven't had it, but I have... Well, in the eight months between the time you applied, if you had spent 20% of the energy you did in getting into here, into Unreasonable, into figuring out how you could leverage your loan, you'd be a lot further ahead on your business. Maybe. The thing is... Well, we'll have to see if people want to leverage loans like this in Uganda. The Bodo market is still considered a... Yeah, you'd have to see, but you haven't seen. That's right. That's that's what I'm uh, beating you up on. I know, but I'm here to get beaten up, and I'm here to... Uh... No. I, I don't know how to put this. Um, an entrepreneur that owns a business... You know the just do it slogan? I yeah. mean, you don't come here to be beaten up, to be told to do what you need to do as an entrepreneur. You do it, and then you get some more help from here. Right. I, I am, my reaction is, you've got assets that are loanable assets and you haven't checked whether, now maybe there's uh, no collateral value in Uganda because like the insurance company, they feel that that's too risky. But if you take the comparable situation in this country, one of the biggest industries, and it's a big rip-off industry, is, rip, is, is uh, making bad loans to poor people at huge interest rates, which uh, allow for all kinds of foreclosures and losses but still make money. Right. So there are people who are loaning people who are living from pay to, paycheck to paycheck at exorbitant rates and so on. Those notes have real, there's a whole market in any kind of note. And uh, I've dealt, uh, I was in real estate for a while and I took back mortgages on properties and second mortgages. You can get loan value in this country on third mortgages. You're gonna get poor loan value. If you're gonna sell them for cash, you're gonna get a deep discount. Maybe you'll only get 30% cash uh, on a bad third mortgage that has a lot of debt against it and not that much value. You see what I mean? But there's, I see what you mean. there's a value to everything. So um, I don't wanna overdo this, but what I'm saying is your major question of me is, how do you scale it up and how do you get financing? Well, the first thing is you've got to do the basic research about, because on the other side, to get away from hitting you over the head, you've done a great piece of work. You've loaned your own money, that's a classic entrepreneurial thing. You've taken money, 10 grand that you made, that's hard earned money. You've invested it yourself, you've made out well with it. There's somebody else who will say, I mean, there's somebody already who said, in spite of the risks of the Boda Boda market, he invested the same as you did. You can probably find other people that will do that. Uh, you know about all those uh, different right. things. You know the vehicle on the net uh, for credit. 
Um, oh, I, it's one of the things about my age, I, keep, I don't remember names. Uh, there's a couple of students at Stanford uh, that started this thing on the net where you can batch loans and apply for financing. I don't know. Uh, I'll get it for okay. you. Uh, there's, yeah. a, there's a thousand things that you need to apply the same entrepreneurial spirit that you applied in making this investment in the first place. But it's got to go way beyond the first investment. That's a great uh, achievement on your part. But you got to apply that same entrepreneurial spirit to a whole bunch of other stuff. If you're running a business, yeah. You got to learn about banking, about financing, about business plans, all that stuff. Yeah. And and uh, unreasonable can help you. Mm -hmm. But I would have checked some of this stuff out already before I came here. Is is what I'm saying. I understand. Well, the bottom line is that I'm moving back to Uganda after this with yeah. no end date and no agenda or another thing after that. Okay. So I am committed. And, you know, very frankly, this wasn't going to pay my bills and I had to balance other things that I was committed to as well along the way. So I understand your uh, militant commitment interest, but uh, I'm here for a reason, and it's to learn stuff like this. Okay. Or even to get pointed in in the direction of the stuff that I don't know. Okay. So I'm, I'm happy and I'm excited and, uh, you know, maybe one of, if we, our, our next couple of uh, hires, so to speak, in Uganda will be probably loan managers, but if we make another high skill hire um, soon, it's probably going to be a finance and banking sort of person to help us uh, um, I'm running a water business in, in uh, India. Mm -hmm. I'm on the streets raising the money for it. Right. The CEO, if this is your company, you, you, you're going to have to play an active role in, in raising the money yourself. Right. You can have people to help you. Sure, sure. No, I'm, I'm not talking. That will be part of my job. But I mean, just in terms of managing some of the financial elements. Um, that may not be my strength. I mean, that's even just... No, I understand that, but but uh, the question you asked me is how do you scale up and how do you raise the money to expand? Yeah. And I'm responding to that question. The guy that you hire, unless he's unusual, or the woman that you hire, is not likely going to be out raising yeah. the money. Right. That's okay. okay. I'm I'm, I'm excited to do that. I'm happy about it. So, how are you going to live in the meanwhile? Um, so, we, we could pay me uh, right now. We're, we're, our weekly cash flow is uh, reinvesting 75% of revenue into new loans. So, our expenses are under 25%. So, if we can raise any investment or funding uh, through the in investors here at the Unreasonable Institute, we're going to be fine. And probably I may kind of defer part of what my salary would be if we don't raise enough to get to where we want to be. Um, and I've lived in Uganda more than two years. I'm, I'm used to I'm used to it. Uh, and if I need to live more cheaply than ideal, I'll be fine. Um, but you got to learn to leverage the paper that you accumulate. Yeah, I think that's a big And one. even if you can't do it in, in Kampala, the investors that are interested in putting up money for a social cause, uh, that's a classic investor who's willing to take a higher risk. Right. Especially if you have a track record. Yeah. You've got a little summary of how your current loan package looks as an investment? Yeah. Yeah, I do. By the way, I should have said this right at the beginning. The ground rule for me is, I am brutally honest, and I expect you to be as well. That's okay. I am, usually. Okay. Um, yeah, so I So think, you're not too put off by my tirade? No, I think it's important. I mean, I, uh, I understand everything you're saying, and I think that you're right, in the sense that if I had been 
doing this 100% of the time, we would be a lot further on, or even 50% of the time instead of 20 or 30. Um, but I think the most important thing is not coming from a place where you think that because it's going well, you know what you're doing. I'm very certain that we don't know what we're doing and that we're uh, going to learn a lot uh, as fast as we can. And that's one reason that I'm looking to go um, from 40 or 50 bikes where we are now to, to 200 to 250 as quickly as possible because there are a lot of things we're not going to figure out that work or don't work until we get pushed out of our comfort zone. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, for me, uh, for the past 30 years, it's been an ongoing, non-stop learning process. And uh, what I, what frightens me more than anything is seeing some people who uh, get some de degree of uh, notoriety and start to believe their own cr press clippings and stop learning. So it's it's really critical that you keep learning. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, so my, my hope is to raise enough financing, however we do it, to get up to 200, 250. And we gotta then, head back. Yeah, we should head back. And then figure out what's what's working and what's not as quickly as we can, and then and then, then look for some even more serious 